This week, whether it's the UK and French governments or climate czar John Kerry, everyone's getting hammered for saying one thing and doing another. China is attacked by some for the latest reports alleging systematic rape and torture of the Uyghurs and the fallout in the EU from the vaccine wars continues. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Saying one thing and doing another. Seems there's a lot of it about this week when it comes to climate change. Climate scientist James Hansen made UK headlines this week by calling out Boris Johnson's government for promoting its climate leadership in advance of hosting the COP26 summit while allowing a new coal mine to go ahead. Now, this story is remarkable for two reasons. There's the substantive question of the coal mine, and then there's the role that Jim Hansen has taken on himself. Let's deal with the first one first. This is the proposed Woodhouse Colliery, a coal mine in Cumbria in northern England. It would produce specifically coking coal for use in steel production, around 3 million tonnes per year, and it would run from around 2023 up to 2049. This is the sort of issue that is highly symbolic, gets a lot of people hot and bothered, but you need to be able to step back and ask some practical questions. Yes, this is a new source of fossil fuel at a time when the government is implementing a net zero carbon programme. But over the coming couple of decades, even within that programme, fossil fuels are going to continue to be used because they're simply not the infrastructure to switch everything over on day one. So... Is this simply a question of where we source some of the fuel that we know we're going to use anyway? And if we don't have this, then we're going to have to import it from elsewhere. And the answer is yes, up to a point. Right now, the UK steel industry uses around 6 million tonnes of coking coal per year. That is imported from different parts of the world, mainly America, but none from Europe. So all from much further afield. You can imagine that having half of that amount mined locally would actually not be a bad thing from an environmental point of view, so long as it didn't slow down or prevent the development of the hydrogen technology to replace it in steel making as currently planned. According to the Committee on Climate Change Net Zero by 2050 plan, the carbon emissions from steel making decline gently to start with and then really plummet after around 2033, presumably as the hydrogen alternatives come online. Now, it could be that that's an open secret. It's not going to happen on that timeline. It declines rapidly because there are small numbers of extremely heavy users when steel making. So once they switch their processes, it makes a massive difference all at once. Maybe they know that it's going to happen by 2050, but somewhat later than the committee has projected. These things normally take longer than you think. It may not even hinge on that. Because according to at least one report, 85% of the output is going to be exported anyway. So then you're looking at what the pathways in other countries might look like. The government's excuse for the mine has been pretty weak, to be honest. They said it was a local matter, didn't intend to interfere with local democracy. Now that's not exactly an argument from conviction. I could see how you might construct an argument saying we're not going to be able to abolish coke for steel on day one, so it's better to produce it locally. If the government can't bring itself to make that argument, then I'm not much inclined to on their behalf. It's one of those puzzling situations where the public facts don't quite add up, so you end up assuming there's some additional politics going on to it all. Because in every other aspect, the UK seems to be taking the COP26 hosting extremely seriously. I do, however, find James Hansen's role in this remarkable. Here you have a climate scientist making a directly political initiative aimed at a foreign government. Because this is political. As I've just explained, you could see that opening this mine was a legitimate policy decision within the context of an overall net zero programme. Environmentalists will always be against any and every fossil fuel source, regardless of what might be the consequences of not having it in the short term. But is it the role of scientists to step into the public policy arena and start telling governments what their policies should be? As citizens, of course, you can have whatever politics you want. It's a free country, or countries in this case. 
But he didn't speak as a private citizen. He spoke as the father of climate change science. And that is very publicly putting scientists into the role of political activists. Are you quite sure that's where you want to be? Because policymakers have to balance all sorts of interests. By intervening in the role of an expert, we're quite happy with the degree to which you're stepping outside your area of expertise. Of course, no environmentalists, no broadcasters are asking such questions. For them, if they can use the voice of a scientist to imply that the government isn't following the science, then that's a great story. But if you're worried about the politicisation of science, as I think we should be, then it's arguably a counterproductive initiative. Besides, James Hansen, you might want to have a look a bit closer to home. Apparently, Hansen cc'd President Biden's climate czar, John Kerry, in on his letter to the UK. John Kerry, meanwhile, was being challenged at home for his apparent fondness for flying his private jet. He said that using the jet was, quote, the only choice for somebody like me. There has been some lively commentary as a result of that choice of words. I mean, if you wanted to project the appearance of the arrogant elite saying it's one rule for you and another for people like me, you couldn't have done it much better. Now, personally, I agree with John Kerry, albeit he couldn't have picked a worse sentence with which to defend himself. I have never said that people shouldn't fly in videos on this channel or in articles I've written over the last decades. You live as part of a system that you're in even as you're trying to change a system. It's only hypocrisy if you tell others that they can't do what you're doing. I've said that publicly. I've said that I disagree with environmentalists who try to guilt trip people over flying. But even so, if climate scientist James Hansen wants to complain to governments, might take the view he should start closer at home. Except he does actually have a track record of complaining about John Kerry. Namely, after Kerry had been heavily involved in setting up the original Paris Agreement in 2015. James Hansen dismissed the agreement as a fraud. He said it should have had a carbon tax built into it. Before then, he complained about being silenced by NASA under the Bush administration when he was also making policy arguments. So James Hansen moved from a climate scientist to a policy activist quite some time ago. President Macron in France discovered the dangers of saying do as we say, not as we do this week, when the courts found against his government because it wasn't delivering the climate change goods. In a case that environmentalists called the case of the century, so no hubris there obviously, the French government was found guilty of culpable failure by not meeting its own climate goals. It was the result of a lawsuit brought by four NGOs, including Greenpeace and Oxfam, which had drawn in actors and celebrities and had gathered 2.3 million signatures in support. France has signed up for net zero by 2050, as all the EU countries have, but the court was told that they weren't on the right trajectory to meet that target. In its defence, it had argued that it wasn't solely responsible for what happened in the country influencing carbon emissions. For example, consumer behaviours were also part of the picture. What this means for France's future policy is not clear. But the tolerance of the people saying one thing and doing another seems to be the fighting ground now wherever you look. Now, in a minute, we'll look at the rest of the week's news. But first, in the US Congress, controversial Republican representative Marjorie Taylor Greene was stripped of her committee assignments by Democrats and supported by 10 Republicans. Why? Because of her history, before being elected, of promoting conspiracy theories such as QAnon and stories about Hillary Clinton taking part in satanic rituals and Pizzagate. Basically, she couldn't see a rabbit hole without wanting to dive down into it, although she has since recanted on her previous beliefs. The New York Times called on Biden to appoint a so-called reality czar to fight what it labelled as disinformation. Critics reply that the other side has plenty of moments of its own where its grasp on reality could be questioned. For instance, there are some that have promoted outlandish theories about the actions of the State of Israel or indeed the Bush administration around the 9-11 terrorist attacks. How did the influence of conspiracy theories become so powerful to the point where they're now breaking into mainstream political discourse? Is what we're seeing qualitatively different to conspiracy theories throughout history? 
How can you tell the difference between a real-life conspiracy, because such things have happened, and modern fantasy versions? And what, if anything, could or should be done about it? Well, that's the rabbit hole that I'll be diving into in Monday's video next week, going live on this channel at 7pm UK time. Join me then, if you dare. Former President Trump was invited to his own impeachment this week, an invitation which proved not to be enticing enough to persuade him to actually accept. Nobody thinks the impeachment is that important, since the result now is pretty much a foregone conclusion. But it's worth noting the nature of the event. Democrats could have decided to submit a censure motion instead of, or even as well as, the impeachment. But they didn't. If they'd submitted a censure motion, they would most likely have gotten Republican support for it, in sufficient numbers anyway, to see it passed. If they chose specifically not to do that, it gives you a sense of where the political calculations are. So the reason why it's so hard to get bipartisan support, because politicians are always looking to the next election. And that's not unique to either side. Democrats have an interest in spreading the blame for January the 6th to all Republicans, not just Trump. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said last week that the enemy is within the House of Representatives. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted at Ted Cruz, you almost had me murdered. And in a partisan world, it all makes perfect sense. If damage has been done, you want that to be done to your opponent in the next election, not just the one in the previous election. So they have little incentive for a censure motion that would provide the optics of the House united against the extremists of January the 6th. In the meantime, President Biden has announced to the world that America's back, and that means that diplomacy is a thing again, rather than angry late-night tweeting. When it comes to the foreign policy agenda, some might feel that angry late-night tweeting might not be a bad idea right now. The BBC released a report this week with interviews with several women that have been held in China's re-education camps for Uyghurs and a former guard there. It alleged that there was an organised system of mass rape and torture, as well as some forced sterilisations. The testimonies are pretty harrowing. And the BBC noted that although the stories couldn't be verified, all the facts given on timelines and locations did match up with what evidence there was. The Chinese Foreign Ministry attacked the BBC vigorously for its report, accusing it of pushing fake news, saying the report had no factual basis. The Global Times, a tabloid newspaper backed by the Chinese Communist Party, said that the BBC had seriously violated journalistic ethics. Which is just name-calling, unless you can provide some evidence to the contrary. The US government didn't do all caps tweets, but they did release a statement saying that it was deeply disturbed by the report, saying these atrocities shock the conscience and must be met with serious consequences. The UK government said the report showed clearly evil acts. According to one of the interviewees in the report, the programme was President Xi Jinping's own and was designed to crush any resistance or will within the Uyghur community, an aim that she said was being extremely successful. Not everybody's lining up in a united front against China, however. President Macron of France pushed back against Joe Biden's interest in re-cementing the US-EU alliance against the non-democratic blocs of China and Russia, saying that Europe's interests did not directly align with those of the US. Macron said that the EU should resist the temptation to take sides, saying such an approach would simply antagonise China, which would prompt a reduction in cooperation on such issues as climate change. The EU signed a comprehensive agreement on investment with China in December last year, an act that raised a few eyebrows at the time. Certainly the idea that the UK, the EU and the US could begin to line up as a coalition of democracies alongside Australia and New Zealand and Japan in the face of the authoritarians, which is a plan that's being discussed, seems uncertain. The possibilities for which may not be helped by the fact that tensions in the EU over vaccines, while the crisis moment of last week has passed, has nevertheless continued to build. 
Anger at the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has been building for failings in the EU vaccine procurement programme. It apparently boiled over at a cabinet meeting in her native Germany, with the usually mild-mannered Olaf Scholz exploding into spicy invective aimed at von der Leyen, although she was quickly supported by Angela Merkel. Criticism has been growing since von der Leyen gave interviews defending her decisions and claiming that the 18 million doses administered by the EU so far was an impressive number. Her predecessor Jean-Claude Juncker disagreed, saying, I think it went too slowly, it all wasn't done with maximum transparency. But the tone of von der Leyen's comments have shifted significantly nonetheless. Instead of outrage at AstraZeneca and talking about the letter of the contract, she instead acknowledged that Brussels had underestimated how hard it would be for pharmaceutical companies to manufacture coronavirus vaccines on a vast scale, and said that hurdles are likely to continue. As the months pass, however, and progress elsewhere continues to be significantly faster than in the EU, various countries within the EU are likely to become increasingly rebellious. Von der Leyen is not elected, not thought to be immediately vulnerable, but her position is not going to be comfortable anytime soon. And to kind of illustrate the point, the citizens of France were newly furious this week when a French vaccine, Valneva, will be delivering doses to the UK before any go to France. This is a longer term issue. Valneva won't be ready until the late autumn, but the story is very, very similar. Valneva, which is based in the Loire region of France, has been talking to governments at the launch of a project. The French government had refused to fully fund their research. France has laws against 100% state funding of private businesses, which was one of the things that hampered the negotiations. And then the British stepped in, securing an agreement to supply 60 million doses from their base in Scotland. Frank Grimaud, the company CEO said they believed straight away in our inactivated vaccine. They took all the risks and immediately forwarded 96 million euros to use before the end of December. It's logical that under contract we undertook to deliver to them first. Critics in France have attacked the government saying this was symbolic of the government's poor management of the crisis. It's certainly adding fuel to the fire of Marine Le Pen, the national rally leader who has worked hard to lose the toxic image of the former National Front. Recent polls put her in with at least a shot of actually beating Macron in the next presidential election. And you can see that with an issue like this festering over time, these could be the circumstances that would make such a thing happen. In other news... Leicester University in the UK has been hammered by criticism after it announced it was going to decolonise the curriculum, dropping subjects such as medieval literature and English language, replacing them with, quote, excitingly innovative modules, such as ones looking at race, ethnicity, sexuality and diversity. Two external examiners resigned their positions in protest. Professor Isabel Armstrong returned her honorary doctorate from the university in protest. Whether the protest will be sufficient to turn the tide remains to be seen. And once you've studied sexuality, you'll be wanting to put some practice in, I imagine. If you're doing it in Denmark, there's now an app that you can use to record consent before proceeding. The app, iConsent, enables the process of asking and agreeing to be done in 30 seconds. Once granted, consent is valid for one intercourse and expires after 24 hours. Who says romance is dead? But apparently, astonishingly, the app has not been a roaring success. So think about users finding it about as sexy as a coronavirus government press conference. Good to know that the world still functions relatively the same as it used to, in some ways at least. Now, in a minute, we'll answer a couple of comments and move to the final thought for the week. But first... There are some channels on YouTube that provide solid gold content and become deservedly famous. One of the ones that inspired me from a very early stage and which has then been mentioned back to me unprompted in conversations with friends is one that is well known to a number of viewers here and that is Pothole of 54. 
Potholer debunks bad science, and he does so with a thoroughness that is unmatched. A careful collection of relevant scientific peer-reviewed papers delivered with wit and tight arguments. I wanted to do some more interviews on this channel, so I thought, what better way but to start with an interview with Potholer. Unfortunately, he routinely doesn't do interviews. Fortunately, he agreed to make an exception in this case. And we had a great conversation, talking about the background for his YouTube channel, some of the key scientific issues of the moment, as well as exploring some of those grey area issues that you know that I love to explore. I think you'll find it as fascinating and enjoyable as I did, so join me for that video going live on this channel at 7pm UK time on Wednesday. A couple of comments that came in on the most recent video on Corbett's social responsibility. I've shortened them a bit for time, but hopefully not losing the sense of their argument. How do those of you cheering attacks on wokeness feel about the systemic misogyny and racism that pervades many industries? Does it bother you that blacks, females and other demographic groups are chronically underrepresented? Do their grievances not bother you at all? There's some industries where this is a problem. It's not obvious that importing wokeness into them is the answer to that problem. Corporate social responsibility is always aimed to address issues around equal opportunities and diversity. And it's learned that change in that area is a slow process for reasons that are not always easy to address, alongside some of those that actually are, of course. For example, when I was at Business in the Community a long time ago, I recall that at that time, firms like the Big Four Accountants had outreach programmes into black communities seeking to get more of them to sign up to a career in accountancy. But guess what? It turned out that young black people in those parts of London mostly didn't want to be accountants. They were more drawn to becoming entrepreneurs. Now, is the end result of that fact that blacks were chronically underrepresented at those companies or was it that people with agency of their own had chosen their own path and for people with certain community backgrounds and influences, accountancy didn't have that appeal? Here's the challenge. It could be either. They look exactly the same from the outside. It could just be that their outreach was clumsy and badly designed. It could be that it was just a lame cover for real prejudice. Or it could be that it uncovered a real preference in the community that should be respected. Woke identity politics, with its blunt approach of reducing everyone to their groups, has not in recent times shown it has anything beneficial to address those difficult issues. Now that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be pressure for companies to do better than many of them are doing. But companies, as pragmatic problem-solving agents, need to be able to see what problems there are clearly, not through the eyes of an ideology that sees everything in morally censorious terms. Just because woke philosophy claims to be on the side of people in minority groups doesn't necessarily make it good for those people any more that communism turned out to be good for the workers that it purported to champion. All right, next comment. Although overall people increasingly have access to technologies which have lifted their standard of living, the divide between the rich and poor is also increasing. According to Oxfam, a handful of the richest people own as much as the poorest half of humanity. This is not a future I want. So, two things. First, campaigners naturally focus on the wealth gap. I would rather start with the conditions of the poorest. If the poorest people in the world were raised out of absolute poverty, while at the same time the handful of mega billionaires doubled their wealth, the wealth gap would have increased, but the net benefit would be massively positive. It's surely the absolute conditions of people that matter more than the relative conditions. I try to define what I need and want in my life. If I then look at Bill Gates, well, he's got a lot more than I have. Does that matter? One iota in my ability to live a satisfying life at the level that I was previously happy with? I don't see why it would. So that's one thing. The other, however, is to acknowledge there is a limit to that principle, which will be imposed by society, however you define that, when it gets too egregiously in your face. People who achieve great wealth have felt some of that over the last year when they found that people who were under lockdown were highly prone to reacting rather negatively to celebrities trying to project any vision of themselves whatsoever, really, whether it's the glamour as usual or whether it's that we're all in this together. Capitalism works best when it's able to provide incentives, but the capitalist system doesn't require that a handful of individuals should own you know, half of the theoretical wealth of humanity in order to function. 
The process of correcting imbalances can be extremely dodgy though. Two things this week underline for me the anti-human nature of a lot of our politics and discourse right now. One came when the Reverend Gerald Robinson Brown criticised the national reaction to the death of Captain Sir Tom Moore as a cult of white British nationalism. Here was a man who had fought in the war, who'd been a kind and generous family man for the rest of his hundred years and who had captured the heart of a nation because he doddered slowly and determinedly around his garden to raise money for health charities. And the ideological cult that his wokeness prompted a clergyman, no less, to make that accusation, white British nationalism, completely tone deaf to any sense of humanity and compassion. In a separate example that's different but not different, Charles Moore writing The Spectator talks about the case related to him by a doctor, an 88-year-old man who has been married for 62 years to the girl next door. He came into hospital frail, she was in a nursing home with dementia. He wasn't allowed out so he couldn't see her. Zoom didn't work because she couldn't deal with it and they were both quite deaf anyway. As she was dying in July, alone among strangers, he begged to be with her but was not allowed. It broke his heart and he declined rapidly. When he got a letter inviting him to be vaccinated, he refused, asking why was he allowed to go for a vaccine but not to see the woman I loved more than life itself. Shortly afterwards he died. Those rules were designed to protect his life. Instead, they arguably destroyed it and made it meaningless right at the end. The thing that's common to these two stories is the failure to see individual humanity because of assumptions. One, an ideological assumption to do with critical race theory. One, an assumption that what defines life is the body being functional with no sense that people define what makes life worth living in other ways that make sense to them. Let's see each other as people. Let's break through the ideologies and the top-down rules-based formula on what people think is best for you. Give people their humanity, give them respect, and that means giving them a degree of agency over their own life. That's all for this week. My thanks as always to those who make this channel possible at all, which is the good people who support me on Patreon. Thanks to your support, I'm able to produce three videos per week. With all the preparation and research that has to go into those, I can choose what topics to discuss without worrying about what YouTube advertisers will permit to appear alongside their adverts. If you would like to join them in supporting the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please go to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.